Hi, in this video, we will be talking about the second component of aggregate expenditure called firm's investment. So, the first question you've got to ask yourselves is, what is investment? So, the primary concept of investment is actually quite simple. It is the activity of taking the fruits from the firm and its workers, and we're going to put it back into the production line or its, or its business activities, so that we can eventually create or grow more fruit. So the analogy of more fruit simply means more output. And according to the A equals to Y at equilibrium theory, more output means more income. So what are these fruits that we're talking about? Um, these fruits are actually leftover profits or resources um, such as materials and other work in progress goods that can be put back into the production. Um, you can even use this to buy more equipment, um, buy more machinery so that your production level can increase. Hence, more output, more goods and services, more income. Okay, so what if you face the problem of not having enough fruit to invest into your business activities or your production line? Well, you can simply borrow fruit from another source, like maybe borrowing more cash from the bank to buy more machinery or buy more materials for your production. So by understanding the primary concept of investment, what you should typically see is a positive relationship between the amount of investment and national output or income. And this means that when investment increases, the national output is going to increase and vice versa. Just let me explain the chain of events when there is more investment in the economy. So more investment means more business activities and projects, right? And when there are more of these projects, you're going to create more jobs. So the number of jobs eventually will increase in the economy and when there are more people working, this actually increases the output in the economy. So we know that when A equals to Y, um, more output means more national income. So that's a good thing, right? So what I've done is I've explained to you um, the concept of investment in a very modern context, something that's related to our modern economy. So let's talk about it in a more traditional context, all right? So imagine a farmer that grows wheat. So he's going to sell some of that wheat He's going to eat some of that wheat and he's going to save some of that wheat, right? So right now, the wheat that the farmer saves, he's going to take that wheat and he's going to put it back into the field um, where he can actually grow more wheat for the next season, okay? So as you can see, there is really an activity of investment. Um, growing more wheat is simply output increasing, giving the, giving the farmer more income and the activity of putting the safe wheat back into the field is a act of investment. So there are typically three types of investment that is undertaken by two major groups of people. And these two major groups of people are your firms as well as your households. Okay, so let's talk about the household's investment activities first. When a household invests, we actually call this residential investment. Now, a household to invest they can buy certain types of assets, assets such as stocks and shares, or even property like housing, right? And they buy these assets with a speculative purpose, which means that they are looking for a capital gain in the assets that they bought. So a capital gain actually refers to an increase in the stock price or an appreciation in the property value so that they can sell away either these stocks, shares or property in the future at a higher price to make some form of a profit. Okay, So that's what it means by buying assets for speculative purposes. Now let's talk about a firm's investment activities. When a firm invests, we call this non-residential investment. And just like households, firms can also buy assets and hope for some kind of a capital gain, right? So this is, the, this is similar to households waiting to sell an asset at a higher price to get some kind of a profit. We call this institutional investment. Okay, now firms can also invest in properties, plants, and equipment. Uh, this is an accounting term, so you, those accounting students out there, you should know what I mean. Now, by investing in this kind of stuff, they can actually increase their production, um, which means increasing their output and therefore increase their income. So that's good stuff, right? Now, the other type of investment, which is not so obvious, is called inventory investment. Now, Inventory investment refers to a firm not selling its inventory now, but selling it later instead. 
The reason why a firm might choose to do this is because it might speculate that the price of its goods might just increase in the future. Therefore, if they sell it in the future, they might actually have an inflation gain on their inventory, right? I mean, selling at a higher price, you actually get back a higher income. Okay, now we're going to move on to the most important part of this video. We are going to understand how firms make investment decisions. Okay, so let's start this nice and slow. Now, the first thing that a firm needs to consider is that it needs resources to invest, right? And these resources are, you know, like the fruits that we mentioned. Uh, and fruits can also be cash that the company has accumulated through its cost of business. So a company has got two options, right? It can either use its leftover cash if it has, or it can go to the bank and borrow some cash. Okay, the thing about borrowing money from a bank is that you're going to pay interest on that loan, right? So, I mean, that sucks. And if you're going to use your leftover cash, you're actually going to have to forego interest that you could have earned from putting the money in the bank, right? As a seasoned economic student, you should be identifying this as a form of opportunity cost for the firm. Now, this interest is foregone because you could have put the money into the bank to earn the interest, right? And the act of putting money into the bank is also known as lending money to the bank. When you lend money to someone, you're actually buying a bond from that person. Now, a bond is just a fancy term for IOU. So when you buy an IOU from the bank, the bank's simply owing you some money. So if you're gonna borrow some money to invest and the interest rate rises, what you'll notice is that the cost of investing is going to increase. And of course, when the interest rates fall, what happens is that the cost of borrowing reduces, which means that the cost of investing reduces as well. Now, let's assume that you use your leftover cash to invest. So when you use the leftover cash to invest and, inc and interest rates increase, what happens is that the opportunity cost of investing will increase. All right? And when interest rates fall, the opportunity cost is going to fall as well. So I can actually make a conclusion down here. And my conclusion is simply this. There is an inverse relationship between interest rates and the amount of investments that firms make in the economy. Very simple. So let's just do a quick recap since this is the most important part of the video. Let's talk about the investment decisions, right? So now... Investment decisions depend on the opportunity cost of lending money or what we call buying bonds or the cost of borrowing money, which is also known as selling bonds because you're selling people IOUs, you are owing people money. So these two types of costs are actually the same and they refer to the interest rates in the economy. So more specifically, I'm talking about the nominal interest rates. However, using the nominal interest rate is not a good enough measure um, because of this thing called inflation. So we are going to denote inflation with um, the figure pi. Okay? Now, when prices increase, your return on investment is going to increase. And it's an increase in return on investment because when you sell stuff at a higher price, you get a higher income, right? Therefore, this inflation actually offsets the opportunity cost of lending money or the cost of borrowing money. So, the real interest rate should be the deciding factor for investment decisions, right? So, how do we calculate the real interest rate? I think we've done this in a previous video. Simply take your nominal interest rates minus your expected inflation rate. Okay, so I'm going to modify my, cons my conclusion right now. I'm going to modify it in such a way that there is an inverse relationship between real interest rates and the amount of investment in an economy. Okay, now that we've got the shitty and confusing part out of the way, let's talk about the easy stuff, right? Let's talk about the math. We're going to take a look at the investment function and you realize that this is, this is much simpler as compared to the consumption function that you learned in the previous video. Now, the investment function is simply a function of the real interest rates as discussed as the previous section earlier, 
So we realize that there's an inverse relationship between real interest rates and the amount of investment. So if I'm going to plot the graph with my real interest rates on the vertical axis and the amount of investment in the economy on the horizontal axis and draw the investment function, I should see a downward sloping curve, right? So when interest rates is high, you will get a relatively low amount of investment and when real interest rates fall, your amount of investment will increase from I0 to I1, okay? So, as you can see, this investment function right here is actually a econometric function. Um, I introduced to you the concept of econometrics in the, previous, in the previous video. So you notice that the total amount of investment is actually your dependent variable. It depends on the explanatory variable real interest rates and I0 and I1 are simply the parameters of this econometric function. Right? So I think you will find this pretty similar. And um, this negative sign over here actually accounts for the um, negative relationship between real interest and investment. And just like consumption, I can break down the investment function into two parts. The first part is made up of autonomous investment. Now, I think if you recall from a previous video, autonomous investment simply means the amount of investment which is not affected by any explanatory variable like real interest. And you also have your induced investment. This is the amount of investment which is affected by the real interest rate. So this is made up of I1 multiplied by the real interest rates. So let's take a look at I1. I1 is simply the sensitivity of investment to the level of real interest rates in the economy. As you can see, this parameter is somewhat similar to the marginal propensity to consume. But um, you know, this is not about consumption, it's more about investment. Okay, so let's take a look at the value of um, I1. Now, the value of I1 depends on many, many factors. You know, it, is, it doesn't lie between 0 and 1, it can be any number. Okay, it, it depends on the economic outlook, and it also depends on the length of the investment maturity. Um, this is not necessary for you to know for introductory economics, so don't worry. Just take I1 as it is. Okay, cool. Now that you understand investment, let's put investment together with consumption. Okay, now we're going to take a look at the AE function, and we're going to assume that we are in an economy with only two entities. There are households and there are firms. Okay, we're going to assume that there's no government. Um, obviously, this is hypothetical, but um, just imagine that there's nobody running the economy. I mean, how nice that would be. Um, I don't think that would be nice, but uh, yeah. Okay, so the aggregate expenditure is going to look like this. AE equals to Y equals to consumption plus investment. So if we're going to expand this function now, I'm going to get this. C0 plus C1 multiplied by the um, level of disposable income. Um, of course, that depends on the type of taxes, plus I0 minus I1R. So this portion here refers to the consumption function, and that is the investment function. Okay, now I'm going to draw the Keynesian cross diagram. Okay, now the Keynesian cross diagram is, just to remind you, it is the area expenditure on the vertical axis as well as output on the horizontal axis. And I have to draw a 45 degree line to show AE equals to Y at equilibrium. Okay, now I'm just going to draw the AE function without investment, so just consumption. So this curve is AE equals to C0 plus C1 times my disposable income. Okay, and what I should get is an output at equilibrium point A of Y0. Now I'm going to add investment into the picture, and what you realize is that this is not affected by income or disposable income whatsoever. Therefore, it is actually a lump sum increase in aggregate expenditure. Therefore, the vertical intercept is going to increase by I0 minus I1R. So I'm going to shift my AE curve directly upwards, and there I have it. I have my new AE curve. Um, I, I forgot to put C1 multiplied by um, YD in this function, but I'll just add it on later. So I'm going to get equilibrium at point B, and you realize that I actually have a higher income. Um, let's assume that real interest rates was originally at R0. And we're now going to take a look at what happens if real interest rates rise from R0 to maybe say R1. So what is going to happen? So this is going to cause AE to fall because of the negative sign in front of the parameter I1. So you see, an increase in R will cause a decrease in AE because you're, you're deducting the total amount by a larger number. Therefore, the entire AE curve is going to shift down 
and I'm going to have this function. Again, I forgot to add in C1 times YD. I'm going to add it in later. Okay, so as you can see, total aggregate expenditure is going to fall, and um, you actually have a lower amount of income. And if R0 is going to fall to R2, you will notice that A is going to increase because, again, of this negative sign. So comparing to R0, my AE curve is going to shift upwards to this red line over here, and uh, there we have it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add um, C1 multiplied by YD because I forgot to add it on uh, into all these um, curves over here. Okay, um, one more, and we're done. Okay, that was just to show you what happens to aggregate expenditure when there is a change in real interest rates and when you add in the investment function to the entire expenditure function. Okay, now let's take a look at different variations of the investment functions, shall we? So investment can also be a function of both real interest rates as well as income. Well, you might be wondering why the hell has income got to come into the picture? We'll get to that soon. First, take a look at the new investment function. You'll notice that there is a I2 multiplied by Y at the back of the function. So what happens is that when my income is going to increase, my total investment is going to increase as well. And of course, um, when in income decreases, then the total amount of investment is going to fall. Now, let's take a look at the intuition behind this um, phenomenon. Okay, now the intuition is basically this. When firms have got more income, um, of course, Y equals to income for the entire economy, but the firm's, invest the firm's incomes are going to rise as well. They're going to have more leftover cash or resources to put it back into their production, right? So this is where investment is going to increase. I think that makes a lot of sense, right? Now, let's take a look at the parameter I2. What is I2? So I2 is actually the sensitivity of the amount of investments to the level of income in the economy. Now, I2 is, is, is more similar to your marginal propensity to consume than I1. Um, and of course, I2 can take the value of zero and between zero and one, okay? Because um, you can't invest more than what you earn, right? So you've seen a variation of the investment function. Let me show you a variation of the consumption function where consumption depends on real interest rates. So the new consumption function is going to look like this. I'm going to add minus C1 times R at the back of the function. And when real interest rates increase, consumption is going to fall. And when real interest falls, consumption is going to increase. Well, this makes sense, right? Remember, your real interest rates is also your cost of borrowing. So when the cost of borrowing increases, your spending is going to fall because it's, if it's more expensive to borrow, you're going to spend less, right? You're just going to save. So this works in the opposite direction as well. Therefore, you see an inverse relationship between your real interest rates as well as your consumption. So as you can see, there are many variations of the consumption investment functions. Soon you might see it in the government spending function as well. We'll go into that in the next video. In the meantime, I want to thank you for studying with Quickonomics.